now. Alright guys, welcome to our second UK Shoutcasters podcast. My name is Peter Canafit Hartnell, here with a star-studded lineup of celebrities. Of course, Ibris Dyer joining me once again. Ibris, how you doing? <coughs> that good, huh? <laughs> what, what a star. <laughs> <laughs> Very well, thank you. Oh boy. Uh, moving <laughs> moving swiftly on. <laughs> uh, oh, all the better for hearing you cough out your illness. Uh, we've thank also you. got the returning John Ellis, the player development coach for XL. John, I hope you're feeling a little bit better than Ibris is. Yeah, I don't have an intro like that, unfortunately. So, yeah, I'm yeah. doing fine. Uh, new to the podcast. Uh, Alex, not that chrome car, Michael, a shoutcaster. Uh, Alex, I hope I you're mean, enjoying I'm, this beautiful I'm, English weather. I'm having a great time so far. It's been absolutely <laughs> fantastic just to, uh, no, just really happy to get talking about shoutcasting. All right, and good l- one. last of all, we'll have Chris, Chris Stealth Curtis, caster, presenter, and host extraordinaire. Chris, how you doing? Uh, I'm good, but uh, I mean, honestly, I'm I'm trying to hold back, like laughing and crying at the same point, just because this intro was just perfectly timed. <laughs> I know, oh. right? I'm not sure if any of us can really just pop Ibris at this point. <laughs> thank you, thank you. No, all, can but, we just have but... Ibris just just do a whole thing on yeah, his own? Yeah, just kind just... of rolled for an hour. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I yeah. listen to that. Oh, you're very oh. sweet. Uh, So, something to get out of the way before we get into the questions is that uh, John is part of organising, along with Excel, uh, a Clash event, which is closing today, as in today, the the 20th, uh, I think presumably at maybe, I don't know, 5 o'clock. But John, could you give us a little bit about that Clash event for the League of Legends event for, which is coming up next week? Yeah, sure. So um, they're launching Clash, which is a team-based sort of one step up from Ranked, um, a few steps up from Ranked Flex, hopefully. Um, And to celebrate the launch, Riot UK are hosting an event in London at the Loading Bar, is it called? Oh, uh, Loading Server. Yeah, yeah. Server Loading. It's called both in in the thing. Well, anyway, um, you can find (laughs) it on their Twitter or on the Excel Twitter and... Um, I think there's 20 spaces for people to come and do basically a coaching session with me and Ferndog, the other coach for Excel. So it should be really fun. We haven't quite decided how we're going to lay out the session yet, um, but there's 10 computers at the venue apparently. So we're going to be doing uh, four teams of five and you'll get to play some and we'll go through VODs and we'll, um, yeah, hopefully just try and talk about the sort of basics for team play and the difference between maybe what you were, had been doing in rank flex as a five and what you could do in uh clash there's also a riot event immediately afterwards isn't there with from six to nine uh i yeah. think at the same venue yeah I, I think it's at the same venue that one i have even less details about so <laughs> as far as i know there's a event there's a like socializing meeting people uh there's gonna be people like fox drop there as well um so it should be really fun all right. Well, with that out of the way, let's get to our first round of questions. So, uh, Ibris, since we never really decided between, uh, we're kind of focusing on, on Alex and Chris in this episode. But Ibris, I'll leave it to you to decide who we're gonna punish first with our barrage <laughs> of insightful questions. <clears throat> All right. Um, how how insightful? What are the questions on? Because we have we have an Overwatch <laughs> caster and we have a. A Call of Duty caster. Well, so I think we should ask them both about League of Legends. <laughs> <laughs> oh my I mean, I can answer that quite poorly if that's what you want. <laughs> All right. Well, I know uh, things happen. It's chaotic. People die, and you try to destroy each other's bases. There you go. See? That's League of Legends in a nutshell. That. All right, well, <laughs> nice it's one. nice one, Chris. Uh, all right, since Chris took the wheel there, let's yeah. just go for him. All right, so oh, crap, Chris. Yes, you put yourself in the firing line. So, uh, from what from what you've told me, uh, you started out as a Call of Duty Black Ops player, uh, but you transitioned from there to running your own team. That seems like quite a large leap. How do you kind of get from one to the other? I mean, it wasn't that big of a leap, if I'm honest. Um, I was basically running 
uh, my own team whilst I was playing anyway. It was, you know, four four mates got together and started playing some Call of Duty. And, um, yeah, just really got intrigued into to the competitive scene. And so, we just, you know, we, we tried to dive straight into it and make a name for ourselves. And in doing so, did not, by playing anyway. <laughs> Um, the best way to do by it. By playing, I, I was I was the worst player known to man. It was no, no, uh, no, it's not hit it, not terrible. Um, and so because I was so bad, I got dropped from my own team. Oh, jeez. Uh, and so I started managing um, other teams instead. So I started creating other teams uh, in America and here. And yeah, it was, it, was, it was quite easy to transition, if I'm honest, just because I knew what to do already. It was kind of simple, just keep people happy end of the day this is what we call um, compromising your dreams but uh, <laughs> oh, <geez. laughs> oh my god Real, realistic goals are uh, a good one you know oh. i thought you were going to say chris that uh, you dropped being a player to start your rocky training montage to come back better than ever and then go on to win the world champs or something i thought that was where we were going but uh Oh, I wish. Oh my god, that's been insane. But um, I don't have the skills to make a Rocky montage or the skills to make it to World Champs. So we'll just we'll cut that right at the ankles and just cut it short. Chris, yeah, yeah. man. While everyone else was playing COD, he was playing Street Fighter. <laughs> so, Chris, it feels like there's some question marks in there though, because like, you know, you said you just kind of like started up teams and things, but how does the person even do that? I mean. So, as a player, you get to know certain like, other players and other teams. So, you, you play against them, obviously, scrim against them, you talk to them on a, like a regular basis. So it's, it's quite easy to then approach someone and say, hey, look, I'm looking at running my own team. Do you, you, do you need a brand to, to be represented by? Or do you, know, do you want a brand to represent? And nine times out of ten, with the COD community, they lap up the chance to, to do so. Uh, any sort of brand exposure, they'll, they'll take it. So, you know, it was it was relatively easy. I picked like I didn't ever pick up any big names, but I picked up a, a few players who've gone on to to place quite well at other events, uh, not under my brands, unfortunately, but um they they did significantly well for themselves. So, yeah, it's it's quite simple. Um, there's other obviously forums that you used to be able to to find other players on, um, which are no longer accessible anymore. But yeah, I mean, Twitter is the biggest one. Like just tweet out saying, looking for team of two, and you know you get like several replies, and you just scurry through, watch their streams and their you know, videos, and see what you like. Oh, fair enough. So simple. How did you go from team management into casting then? Well, that one was a, a bit of a, a weird transition, uh, and it all escalated very, very quickly. So obviously from. Being a manager, I used to do everything within my power to showcase my teams um, to the best of my abilities. So what I used to do is I used to run show matches every Thursday night for my teams to play uh, bigger and better teams that they wouldn't come across uh, usually. Uh, in doing so, I used to stream it myself because I couldn't, nobody would cast it, basically. The already Call of Duty casters that were about refused to do it because uh, they wanted money uh, and it was just you know lack of exposure at the end of the day so i said Fine, ah, you know? i see you were doing like the equivalent of bronze sub wars in, <laughs> in Call of Duty. So, <laughs> handpicking a couple of people here pretty much there, uh own personal stream uh yeah casters wanting money is you know a recurring theme across every everything but you you know you understand yeah. that if they're established brands or or people or whatever they just yeah okay i understand that yeah. they want compensation for their time but yeah props to you for setting up yourself and getting yourself into such a position anyway yeah i didn't mean to derail there please please do continue how you can <laughs> from your There's own no problem. performance with, with whatever into this full-time career of uh whatever it is that you do right now <laughs> <laughs> well uh one i wish it was full time uh, unfortunately is not just yet but we're getting Fair there enough. um yeah, yeah no no join the club of uh, pretty much everyone else in the school <laughs> um but yeah so i i started running these these showcases and streaming myself and because no one would cast it i decided to take upon myself to do so uh and i managed to get uh one specific uh night to have my my team play a pro team 
Uh, so they came in, played each other. I casted it. And a couple of big names were in the stream watching um, from the, the casting community because obviously the pro team was playing and they wanted to see what it was all about. So they picked up me, you know, casting, and they were like, okay, it's quite interesting. So um, within the space of two to three months, I went from obviously doing online tournaments um, and my own streams to going to my very first event. Uh, and from that, I've, I've not looked back. I've, all I've done is cast and host and present for the last four or five years. Wow. All right, man. That's that's uh, that's the good way to do it. Yeah. So um, yeah, you're freelancing now. Um, but you mentioned that you weren't doing casting full time. So, uh, what is it that you do besides casting? If you don't mind us asking, they say ask. That's fine. <laughs> Uh, I'm basically an IT support technician. Uh, okay, so yeah, I sit enough. there and I change passwords all day, every day. Oh, yeah, I've done that. <clears throat> yeah, it sucks. Kind of it's been around the block. He's done a lot of things. <laughs> I've done a lot of things. <laughs> <laughs> we won't go into much detail with that one then. In oh, boy. Old age. But uh, I digress. Anyway, yeah, that's a, not only a good introduction, but also a good answer to our question. But um, yeah, anyway, the moving on to our other guest, Chrome, uh, I think we had a similar question for you in terms of what's led you to the to yeah. the career that you have right now. I mean, I, I started off very kind of basic. I think this was a good two years ago now, maybe coming up to three this summer. But there was uh, my buddies. We always we always to be big on CS at the time. It was kind of the booming, the peak of CS popularity, really. And mm. we were all huge into it as a friendship group. But a lot of them were a lot better than me. So I just kind of played it for fun took it less seriously we all kind of enjoyed watching some of the the matches streamed on twitch but i was i've always been the talker of the group so they said <laughs> um some of them were playing in kind of smaller tournaments not huge um affairs but you know some of the uk internal stuff and they said hey um one of the they're looking for a caster one week and said why don't, why don't you give it a go so i thought this is great this is my first ever cast so i sat there with another guy we started about eight and it ended up with me eating cold pasta at midnight, living the cast of life. This was the dream. <laughs> and it was just, it was great. I enjoyed it so much. It was just talking, but doing it about esports. And, you know, combining that is really, really fun. And since then, I've kind of sprung less CS, more kind of moving into Rocket League, my, my main, and dabbling in Overwatch from time to time. But yeah, I think a lot of esports is kind of dumb luck and who you meet first and how you get into it. So it's... I, I consider yeah. myself pretty fortunate that I managed to get into it when I did. Dumb luck, and then you end up casting Overwatch. Uh, sorry, yeah. casting Rocket League of all things. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, from uh, from one crazy extreme to the other, it just kind of swings, swings. Yeah, cool. man. Um, cool. Pete, well, I was going to say, like, um, I was curious because you you said you do kind of cast a few different games. Mm -hmm. uh, like, what what is it that Rocket League kind of like drew you to be just sort of your main title? Don't say money, don't say money, don't no. say money. <laughs> <laughs> there was some money. No, not at all. Um, it was kind of after that, the, the decline of CS, kind of with the, the gambling stuff and the skins, it just kind of dropped off in popularity. Some of us, we started doing exams, so there was less time to play it. Rocket League was a, a game that kind of fit that casual idea. You could play it for fun, and the, obviously the ranked games were only five minutes long, so far, more, far easier to do than a 40-minute average CS game or whatever you may have. So that was kind of where we, as a group, moved to uh, in game. And then I kind of started getting involved with orgs and just saying, hey, what can I do? You know, kind of get involved. So we saw these, we saw the tournaments and then it kind of springboarded from that into casting. And now uh, I recently came back from uh, the Gfinity finals having a meet up with like all the EU guys in our org, which was, that's the second time we've done it. And it's just been really great fun to go from essentially nothing to being part of a bigger esports organization. and meeting people making those connections and getting involved in a game that we all really enjoy rocket league <laughs> <laughs> don't piss on rocket league it's actually one of my favorite games to play at the minute no, yeah, I, I really like i'm rocket so league. bad at rocket league <laughs> i try but i'm so bad well yeah mate, can you go can you run a class for us afterwards you know <laughs> oh I'm no, I'm no expert myself i've kind of had to grind my I'm sure there's many better people to do but it, it, the beauty of the game is it's so simple in that your average viewer could just pick it up and understand what's going on mm. i think that's what where some of the more established games they do really well for themselves because they have huge player bases things like league you know everyone that plays league knows it really well but for newer people to have to put that time commitment in it's a lot harder whereas rocket league it has that casual element which i think makes it really nice to just jump into 
every now and again. It doesn't have to be a huge chore, whereas some other games can sometimes feel like it's a lot more of a time investment. Yeah, conversely, though, you do have those, like, esports snobs, as it were, that are like... True, true. <laughs> this is too, uh, you're laughing like I'm one of them, but... Oh, yeah, I am. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. It's all good, it's all good. I love, I love my Rocket League, my car football. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, um, <laughs> yeah. So, anyway, uh, you transitioned into cast... Wait, so you never had any aspirations to playing Rocket League professionally or competitively or whatever? It just so no. happened that there was a vacancy in the casting department yeah. and now you're... Pretty yeah, much. okay, cool. I, I when when I started, I was I was bottom of the bottom. I was bronze one, I think lowest of the lows. So there was no no hope in hell for me as a player. But no, I got no, involved. No, our bronze one viewers feel bad. Listeners, <laughs> no, feel no, bad. no, no, there's always, there's always a chance. I started bronze one. We're we're ending up somewhere near diamond now. So they, how does how it. does John feel? <laughs> <laughs> He's, John always feels like, amazing. What? <laughs> I'm just confused. I'm feeling confused. <laughs> How do you get confused about Rocket League, man? You just said it has no <laughs> entry barrier. <down here. laughs> <laughs> oh boy. Uh, oh no. To pivot slightly away from Rocket League for no a second. No punches pulled. Wow. Uh, for I guess this is for both of you, Alex and Chris. Mm -hmm. uh, I noticed that you both you both cast multiple first person shooters. In fact, the same multiple first person shooters: Overwatch and Counter Strike. I know with mm -hmm. Chris, we're having a sideline more in. Call of Duty. I was curious, like, uh, you know, for, for both of you guys, how much of your sort of FPS casting kind of, it, you know, how much do you feel that like those games, or just FPS in general, have sort of a shared skill set, and how much is individual to each game? No, uh, it's, it's quite, like, very similar. I mean, they're both mm. point and click and shoot at the end of the day. Um, obviously, Overwatch has a slight added depth to it with its abilities and such, but I mean, COD and CS, basically the same thing. Um, I don't disrespect any of the CS fans out there, and no, I'm going to get a lot of hate for that one. Um, but no, it's 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 very similar. I mean, the, the skill set that you need to be able to cast both, identical. You can see that there's a lot of ex-COD casters who've transitioned to CS quite fluently, such as you know Machine and Pansy. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's, it's quite easy to just pick up and get into at the end of the day. There's so many tournaments and you know games to cast that there's always a need for casters so it, it again it was just something that just flowed smoothly into it for me mm. I'd, I'd agree with that i think the, the great thing about fps games is a lot of the time in in a way similar to mobas there's a lot more you can talk about with the depth of resource management cs especially kind of the economy weapons grenade sets there's a lot more going on there that you can get into whereas with a game like rocket league it's not as existent so i think Especially with Overwatch, you know, just keeping track of all the abilities, ultimates, counter picks, picks, all the rest of it. There's a lot you can get stuck into there in terms of um, a, a more traditional play-by-play -play color style. Yeah, play-by-play um, -play color style. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, I like how we're asking all these questions about Counter Strike and Overwatch, and John's just there, like, <laughs> what? <laughs> <laughs> That's right, I'm, I'm yeah, enjoying this deep thing. in MS5 right now. Yeah. I'm just, I, uh, I accidentally the first audience of this sort of podcast. Of yeah. <laughs> oh, man. No, I was I was trying to think of a way to to pivot to uh, one of John's specific things. Uh, well, I suppose yeah. I uh, this is going to be a bit of a leap, but whatever. Uh, so to take a break from the casting talk for a minute, the mm -hmm. so John, one of your specialities. Uh, is in the content creation, which I'm sure at least, well, the Alex and Chris have come across in their in their trials, at least in terms of having their okay. casting content turned into other content. Uh, do you have any advice for anybody out there in terms of you know trying to get into the content side of things? Um, I mean, I think that the biggest advice I was actually having this conversation with someone a few weeks ago. The biggest advice for people who want who are creative people who want to get into content, whether it's like a podcast or a show or like analysis or anything like that, is to actually just start. I see so many people with these great ideas of oh, I'm gonna, you know, invite people on from the UK League Legend scene or whatever and talk to them and do this podcast or something like that. And then they don't actually ever give something a go. Um, so I guess it might be worth talking about how I got into doing content for esports um, in general. Yeah, <laughs> he's asking yeah. himself the question. Yeah, 
He knows what he's talking about, so he should. Well, I've got the sheet in front of me now. So... <laughs> Perfect. Quick, um, write right, it down so... and we can ask him and look smart. <laughs> yeah. Good sheet, well, good so... sheet. Um, but, well, it does, it does actually come back to my point as well, so it'll make sense by the time I finish this story. Excellent. Um, so I was doing film at university, and mm -hmm. while at having esports as sort of a passion, um, and I was doing coaching for esports and stuff, um, but then when I started to focus more on doing film and doing documentary film, I just noticed that there wasn't very much content for the UK League of Legends scene, or almost any content. So we're getting to the point where players and coaches were doing it full time, but there wasn't anyone doing content at a professional level. So I just thought I'd give it a go. And that, that's what I mean. So I, I hadn't had any experience of doing event documentary. I've been doing cinematic documentaries. Um, but I just contacted a bunch of organizations and said, right, if you, I'll do it for free, just for expenses, if you don't tell anyone I've done it for free. Um, because it cinematic might not be great. Cinematic documentaries. Yeah. Is that um, like recording part of Avengers on your phone in the in the middle of the <laughs> it's, it's, uh, If anyone's actually interested, it's it's documentary for cinema. Like wow. the kind of documentaries you'd watch in a cinema, not like um uh, like a BBC one or something like that. Oh, um, excellent. But anyway, yeah, so so I just started contacting organizations and just saying like I'm I've got I've got no experience doing esports content, but I've made some films and showed them the films, obviously. Um, and then said, yeah, if you pay my expenses, I'll come and do an event for you. And then um, we'll see what happens after that. So again, it's just about actually doing something. If people want to make films about esports, just contact people, ask them. The worst they can say is no, we, we need someone who's got experience. But especially if you go for, don't expect to be paid, obviously, and go for organizations that are on the smaller end and just get your yeah, foot in the door cool. and start it. Like getting your first on, on the bottom rung of the ladder, as it were, is so vital. And a lot of creative people struggle with the actually doing something. It's the same with like writing scripts and stuff like that. People have loads and loads of ideas, but you never actually write them or mm. make them or everything like that. So that would be the biggest sort of bit of advice. Well, I, I'd imagine for a lot of people, the kind of the thing that's holding them back is just the idea that they would kind of, be shouting into the void, as it were, making content that no one would ever kind of watch it or care about it. Like, how did you get over that kind of idea? Um, that was an issue. I mean, I'm not that, I've never been particularly worried about that. So maybe it was easier for me than it is for some people. I mean, I make stuff that I like. So if I, if I like it, I'm fine with it. So it doesn't matter if anyone yeah. else watches it, basically. Um, I, I mean, to be honest, in esports, the biggest problem in my view in content is because everything's so rushed and it hasn't quite advanced to the level of the other side of the industry. Um, so it's sort of been way overstretched. You get so much compromise in terms of, you know, there'll be like four coaches or whatever, but one person doing content and it just you just can't produce good enough content um, just with the amount of time constraints and stuff like that. Um, so my problem was always the other way of stuff like I wasn't happy with it, but they wanted people want to release stuff because of the the like fan demand and that sort of thing. Um, but I mean, there's there's problems both ways. And again, that I mean, there's loads of reasons to not make stuff. Um, like it might yeah, not be see, any good. We, we you might let podcast. people down. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Just we just do it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we're, we're being rushed by our massive fan base, and that's why the quality suffers a bit here and there. <laughs> But still, the, the thing is, is that this is a better podcast than one that wasn't actually ever made. So yeah. it doesn't matter how Aww. much Just better the, set the idea bar was. Low if they didn't make it, then they're, they're still we're still ahead of them. Yeah, man, it's a it's a better one than the ones that don't have Pete in it. Oh, that's See? definitely true. Yeah. Right, I'm trying to figure out which way around that goes. <laughs> John, well, what was, yeah, yeah, I'm not if, sure if it's a compliment or yeah, I'm not yeah, sure either. Either. really it was, it was or a really big insult. <laughs> so, John, if you're uh -oh. if you're like you know, say if you're a th you know, hypothetical person and you're part of a team and you're trying to get you know you want there to be more content for your team or for your organisation, what kind of avenue or line do you, it, have you found to work in terms of being like how do you persuade people to give you you know if you need resources from a team, we need time to do this kind of stuff? How do you persuade people that it's a worthwhile investment? Well, if you're coming from the organization's point of view or from the creative person's point of view? Trying uh, to make... From the creative person's, but within an organization. Um, 
what well in terms of getting your foot in the door originally in the organization i think you just have to i mean there's you just have to use your words to convince people basically because i think it's a fairly easy sell and then from an organization's point of view um like going for better content that does worse overall that's the hard sell is like if you can release lots of things that are pretty good that's actually going to do you better than releasing one thing that's really good from a sort of creative or for, from a film point of view, which is why we're in this situation, I think, in the first place that, that I see quite a lot in, in all areas of esports, even areas where you'd think there would be the time and the money, they're still... I mean, yeah, like you there. have these NALCS teams that got an own franchising and they have some fan base, but next to no content. But on the other mm. hand, you have um, the teams, like my favorite example right now is Flyquet, who have the Snicker sponsorship, who have, they, they release a, re a decently, I say decently, it's actually pretty good quality, like weekly vlog, uh, some really good content for their teams. But uh, I say teams, I mean one team, but um, they get next to no viewers and they have the lowest fan base of anyone in the LCS right now. So, yeah, I mean, uh, one of the things that I think the LCS teams are sort of caught up on is doing this high production value content. Whereas if you look at esports teams that have been really successful, which is basically COD teams, really, um, compared to like Optic, stuff like that, they, they're entertaining stuff and lots of it works yeah. better. Um, so that's when you need Please to get a discussion between um, the creative person and the... Um, organization itself and and it's all just dependent on what you want is it do you want to get as many fans as possible or do you want to give a as good experience for the fans you do have as possible and that that depends on that like the quality I of think that depends and if you have and, and that sort of thing and if you have the luxury of having a fan base that's big enough to be sustainable if you're only appealing to them and not going for the yeah yeah, I mean, yeah, um, a whatever. lot of things with esports as well is, yes, uh, the fan base and YouTube and stuff like that are potential avenues. Um, mm. A lot of esports teams are mostly focused on performing well and the way they get their money is sponsorships and stuff like that rather than yeah. esports viewership. So, I mean, it's a really interesting uh, like area and each organization approaches it in a very different way. So it's quite um, interesting to see about how how we end up with the end results that we do in terms of the differences in the content that people are producing. Yeah, man, that was a, a really good way to put it. Um, thanks for the insight. Uh, <laughs> now, our other guests, what should we ask them? Well, something which I wanted to, uh, I wanted to come back to Chrome, uh, Alex. Mm -hmm. uh, so something which I think a lot of people may not know about uh, in terms of projects that you've worked with, which are kind of interesting, mm -hmm. is uh, the Digital Schoolhouse. That I saw uh, yeah. asking around about. Uh, could you maybe give us like a little overview of what it is and what your involvement was with that? So Digital Schoolhouse is, uh, I'm not involved anymore with them, but I did a, a short stint as one of their Overwatch casters for a bit uh, down in Kingston in London. It's a project all about getting kids and teachers more involved in schools with ICT, using games to help teach, basically. So they were running, they do lots of workshops within um, various university kind of ICT setups, as well as taking it to elementary schools, helping kids develop those skills that they need in a technological age that we kind of currently live in. So I was doing, they ran a, I believe it was a promotional tournament for League, Overwatch, and one more game, which I cannot quite remember. But there was um, a series of kind of play-ins. And then at the end, they used the Gfinity Arena down at Fulham Broadway for their finals on April the 14th, which I sadly wasn't able to go to for another commitment. But it was a really good experience to get there and kind of network with the people that were running it. A lot of, um, when I was down in London, some some familiar faces from the Rocket League scene, some of the team managers came down to come and talk to the kids. So it's just a really good way of getting a younger audience, as well as kind of teachers who you wouldn't normally expect to get involved. Sometimes you don't see that development in schools and that kind of links to again development and talent pathways um, getting involved with the scene and trying to uh, bring kind of new life if you will jeez <laughs> <laughs> no I, I can i can definitely appreciate I, i'm that. a bit of a rambler i'll be honest ah. no man that was the jeez was the bringing new life into it like <laughs> no, digital it, I mean... schoolhouses procreation <laughs> Oh boy! No, I think, I think that's I think that's completely valid. I mean, I guess I'll throw it open to the rest of you guys. Like, what what are your thoughts on like 
trying to you know trying to integrate with schools and things to try and i guess try and give people an easier line into getting into esports be it in playing or casting it's um, an interesting one really isn't it <laughs> like i mean if you, i remember being like what 14 15 years old playing absolute tons of video games my parents saying why are you wasting your time with this and now it's just flipped the other way around and they're trying to integrate it in into schools and saying, look, it's a viable career now. Do mm. it. Everyone, go play video mm. games, which is great. I like it. Um, I think it will be interesting to see how they develop it, if I'm honest, um, because yeah. Yeah, it's not going to go one way or the other. Um, mm. I think hold it to the same esteem as um, in a similar vein to your traditional sports clubs where, mm. again, it's, yes, there are more careers available than in traditional sports, but again, I think it's naive to assume that uh, all the people that invest time are going to make it big yeah. or make a successful yeah. thing. So you have to treat it like an after-school club. It's good that they have, like, the option to, like, socialize with other people for a hobby that's traditionally seen as antisocial. Mm -hmm. But, um, again, I don't think it's the be all end all of the not only the social stigma or whatever but i also think that uh <laughs> they need to be realistic about what what to expect from it like it's yeah. good to develop some skills uh but i don't think that it's a guaranteed job in the <laughs> in the industry no yeah, i can see that a lot with <laughs> Our, our generation, sorry, more so my generation, I suppose, since I'm probably the younger one here. There's that kind what? of idea of, I, I, surprisingly as it is, I'm I'm still How a student. How old are you? Still what? a student. No, 17. You're 19. 17. What? 17. You're 17. What? Jeez. See, yeah. there's a child in our call. <laughs> <laughs> Quick, guys, we're going to turn it down because I'll tell them what you said before, uh, before we said oh, it. Oh, <laughs> don't bring that up. He sounds older than me. He sounds older than me. Pete, he's old enough to be your kid. <laughs> oh, that's a scary thought. <laughs> but there is that kind of mentality of, oh, I'm going to drop out to become a streamer, or I'm going to drop out to do to pursue oh, a career God, in esports. Yeah. In, in that same in that same vein that you know you used to have, oh, I'm going to drop out of school to be a rock star or play in a band. It's that same idea, just on a different level. And a lot of people don't realise the amount of work you have to invest to try and not only break out but make it big and make it sustainable. But I also, think... you mentioned dumb luck earlier, and that's also mm, that's a huge true. <laughs> but I mean, I guess, I guess that I, I, the way I see it is, there's two sort of things. There's, there's needs to be talk about how, um, like changing attitudes in terms of thinking that esports is just or computer games are just really damaging and there's no benefits. Mm -hmm. Um, which I think we're definitely heading in the right direction. So there's people like British yeah, Esports sure. Association, stuff like that. Oh like yeah, schools, all that kind of stuff. Um, I think that's really helpful, especially for kids some kids that are trying to sort of break out of their shell and they can use that um, and often people are talking a lot during a game even people who aren't necessarily particularly confident in general so i think that we're on the right track but then the other mm -hmm. part is feeding careers into esports um, and professionalism in general um, which i think doesn't work quite the same way here as it does in america for example um, but that's just a doesn't it, it doesn't work in sports in the same way as well so we don't mm -hmm. have the standard pathway of like high school then collegiate then professional which they are trying yeah. to implement esports wise in america um but i don't know how well that's going to work so there is like the new national university esports <laughs> league stuff like that which is really great to get involved in but there's by no means a sort of easy pathway through and i think again i can only really speak with uh, any knowledge from a league point of view i think the promotion of national leagues is what Riot are doing to try and combat that, but I'm not sure if it's going to be as effective as the like college university feed track that we see work so well in America, especially for stuff like football. Yeah, sure. Um, I think that there is a legitimate avenue for success, but I think, again, as you said, it's not easy to get to. And while I think for their efforts to make uh, things like this more readily available for everyone uh, is a step in the right direction. It's good, but again, you have the same yeah, it's issues not of it anymore. being. It's, yeah, then it's just as difficult to get like a career in traditional sports. Like you have the collegiate scene, yeah, but mm. making it big, as it were, you just have to temper your expectations and be 
I, I again, I think it's good that they're socializing. I think it's really good that esports is becoming like video gaming in general is becoming more socially acceptable, and it's but fostering communication. It's giving them all these skills that they can transfer elsewhere. But at the end of the day, um, it's just going to be hard for them to chase their dreams. But I think that the introduction of it to these schools as like an after-school club or as an alternative. Uh, what what is the implementation of this digital school house? Is it like an after school club or is it? A... I think in the way they do it, that a lot of the time they borrow um, university kind of uh, ICT setups. I think they are somewhat club like, somewhat workshoppy um, in that kind of sense. So they do master classes, that kind of thing. Yeah. Okay. That that sounds cool. As long as it's not interfering with their school other working. education. Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. yeah. Then, I think that's yeah. that's a problem a lot of people do struggle with especially kind of in the in the school kind of high school moving into uni uh age group is that <laughs> you mean actually... exactly where you are right now <laughs> yeah well <laughs> unsurprisingly you know some personal <laughs> anecdotes come to life but there is there is the temptation to actually go a bit too ham on on the online stuff and at, that's what you do for everything risk. though yeah no it's, for sure, it's a passion sure. it's, a, it's a work of passion and you just have to balance that with with the rest of your life and i feel like mm. This is again good for that as well because as long as you're teaching them to find a balance, to find something that works for them as individuals, and taking the fact that every mm. situation is going to be different, you're. I think this is a step in the right direction that people are just having more options available to them to follow what they truly want to do. I do think um, at the same time though that like by having stuff like this in place, it helps make it a bit more of a serious proposition, so people can kind of treat it more seriously. And then, <laughs> like, you know, you don't have the whole thing about dropping out of school for esports. Like, I kind of feel like, like, if, yeah, if it's made clear to people how difficult it's going to be, and, you know, you kind of have, you, you know, you have documented... Realistic expectations, yeah. Yeah. Well, like, like with, with what John's doing, like, if you have good content <clears throat> that shows what it's actually like and people watch it, then at least they're making an informed decision. Yeah, on that same note, you, you're showing them again how hard it is, but if they're willing to put in the work and use... Uh, and if the uh, people that are running this are uh, good enough at spotting talent, at seeing uh, what the individual needs of each student is and helping them develop in the ways that they want to, then I'm all for this and I'm all for these legitimate career paths or whatever. If you can get the likes of your Riot, the likes of your ESL, the likes of your Blizzard and whatnot working alongside these uh, things for to help facilitate uh, the people that dedicate their time into getting these smaller jobs that eventually work up into actual, uh, yeah. All right, well, we've, or, uh, we've got yeah, a... being a dead horse here. <laughs> Let, let's, we've got a couple of things to finish up before we close out here. I'm going to try and keep this to 45 minutes. Uh, so a couple of, of last things. So for, uh, for Alex, uh, mm -hmm. you've mentioned you've got some, uh, so I believe you said you've got some experience going to esports lands. Yeah. Uh, like for for any, I guess, of the younger uh, audience or kind yeah. of people who haven't been to lands before, what well, would you learn? Yeah. What <laughs> well, what would you tell people to kind of like to get them to go to their first land? I suppose. Uh, first of all, just in case there's anyone watching who doesn't know what a LAN is, which is an entirely reasonable request, I've had to explain it a couple of times. A LAN is essentially, it, local area network is the, the acronym, but where a bunch of people all go with their computers to one room and kind of game in that one room environment. Um, or depending on the size of the venue, it may be multiple rooms. But the the idea is everyone's under one roof. So to... to Sounds really It's really, really good fun, though. Don't, don't lie, Abris. I know you're all about it. <laughs> But um, no, to people that haven't gone, gone I would I would highly recommend it. It's a fantastic experience. Be careful if you're young, because there is obviously you know concerns. And I would say take a parent or guardian with you, just so that they're happy, that you're happy. You're you know, there's no question about that. But well, old man, really... he's gonna get you. <laughs> we said we weren't gonna talk about that. Really... <laughs> <laughs> he he loaded me with children's card games. Oh god! Oh dear lord! Drop from um, call. Drop from call. <laughs> How do we kick him out? But no, Jeez. definitely try and get involved. I, I think kind of peaking at the end of your teenage years, that's a really good time to go to land. If you've got buddies to go with, all the better. Um, yeah. Enjoyment, because that's where you get the most out of it, is meeting up with friends, kind of getting to see teammates that you've only really seen over the net in real life. is just such a rewarding experience. 
So what was the last LAN you went to? Uh, so I went to Epic LAN 23. Um, so I took the, I was, I was a bit cheeky. I took the Friday off school because I said I was going to go cast. And they let me, the Mad Men, but <laughs> I went. Um, and that was really good fun. I spent the weekend there and then came back. But no, it was really rewarding to see kind of loads of um, different units kind of working. There was content creation teams. I was holed up in, uh, because Rocket League it was kind of still growing at the time. We had our own desk next to the media creation guys. The CS boys had their own room because of course they did. Um, ironically enough, there's a great story there. They weren't allowed to sleep in their room because last time they slept in their production room, it got so bad the smell um that they it was basically unusable for the, the grand finals Ooh. so they uh, oh, they Jesus. were they were kicked out those God. disgusting cs boys <laughs> but no it was really it was really good fun we got um i took i shipped all my gear down uh, in the car and just had a great time meeting people casting the games were great um getting to meet a lot of the players as well you build up a great connection to the scene especially in a smaller scene like uk we don't have kind of that eu that na presence uh within ourselves so making those connections, you know, getting to meet those people is a really, really rewarding experience. And then you can feed that into your later work, works as a caster. You can say, hey, this guy's been to LAN. I know I've met up with him. This is what he told me about this team dynamic or whatever else. So great experience as a caster. Great experience overall as someone who just goes there. Highly recommend it. All right. And, well, this is something a little bit... Uh, I'm not sure how long this will run for. But, Chris, uh, we haven't really touched on this at all. You mentioned right back at the beginning that you've kind of got some experience being a host. Uh, can I just ask how you started doing that? Uh, it was, um, again, a, a lot of luck. So my background is mainly casting. That's what I've done for four years, on and off, nice and easy. Um, what I started doing last year, pretty much this time last year, was I started casting for... Um, a well, uh, a tournament that's being run by a game and the Belong stores around the UK. As probably some of you know about the Belong arenas, they hold a, a tournament uh, every three months, I think it is, um, called the Arena Clash. Mm. Uh, so I started out doing their Call of Duty casting. I did seasons one uh, last February, uh, cast at the Call of Duty finals in London. I then did their summer finals um, in their um, headquarters uh, at the start of September. And after that, I um, emailed them. So the summer season was not particularly well ran with the amount of information that was accessible to the casters. So I knew next to nothing about the teams, the players, or the format going into the grand finals. Um, it was very difficult for me to to cast a story, basically, to tell a story for the entire season because there was no information on a the website, there was mm -hmm. nothing being tweeted about it. It was And he hasn't very worked difficult. with them since. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what I did is I emailed them after the grand final and said, look, I want to run um, a, a weekly recap show, basically, and told them my, like, my story of how I want to run it and you know how it should be done. I get an email a couple of days later saying that they want to go forward with it and would I want to host it. Would so, you took initiative? Of course. I said, yeah. So I said, yes, of oh. course. Um, so the first season was the winter season, which was uh, a weekly recap show. Every week I would obviously talk about the games. Uh, I ended up having to cast all of the games myself as well. So I learned uh, Tekken. League a little <laughs> uh, as much as I could Dude, possibly do. Draws, you man. Um, man. Overwatch and COD. So I learned. So it was the most hectic time I have ever had, but the most fun as well. So I would do a a, a spot on camera uh, in that week. I would then go and record voiceovers and then um, record uh, my casting all in the space of a week for it to go live at 6 p.m. on a Saturday uh, evening on Ooh. Game's Facebook page. Well, uh, I'd so for, I'd was... for a full-time job if I were you. <laughs> <laughs> it was taking a lot out of me um, because obviously I was working full-time at the same time as well. Yeah. Uh, so taking a lot out of me then, um, but... I mean, more than that, my, my director and producer, I have no idea how he managed to pull through. Like, I'm pretty sure he did, like, three, like, 
all nighters in one row. Like, he was mental. Um, but then, like as we were going through that first season, um, a few things started to to pick up, and we we got a bit of notoriety. And then this uh, the season just gone. This um, the spring season came about, and uh, we we hired a second host, so we hired a co-host, and basically it's it's gone up from there because immediately from the start of spring season it was put onto Amazon so we we had a show on Amazon Prime and it was mental like it just it blew up quite big we've had like pro players and a lot of people interested in it and to to go from that to cat, like hosting the player stage i62 off the back of it because <laughs> that's what they you know it, it's how it went about and it's it's a weird transition but just I think a big piece of advice for anyone who wants to, to get into this, just do it. Uh, you know, okay. As John said, just do it and you know, get in touch with people and just ask the question at the end of the day. There's no harm because you never know yeah, what will okay. come out of it. Sure. And when you say you have a lot of people interested, uh, is this really a lot or is it about as many people that watch John's content? Oh, oh wow. Jesus. Everest. That's a big thing. No, That's so harsh. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I couldn't resist. Um, yeah, again, though, uh, it's just about finding that viewer base. And yeah, being on Amazon is sick, dude. That's really um, up and coming. But at some point, I don't know, like, yes, it's really nice to have this grassroots scene and where you're getting just opportunities and you're on the up and up. But on the other hand, I'm. it's concerning that you were doing so much work and it wasn't, like, full-time at all? Like, did they... I, I like that they've got the option to hire someone else to split the workload with you, um, but I think it could have been more sustainable for them to perhaps offer you something full time. Uh, but again, yeah, it's just... you're not the only one who has brought this to their attention. I have said it quite a few times. Um, yeah, UK esports scene, especially is... with what they want to do for the summer season coming up. Yeah, it's just irksome for me. Uh, things like this where. I don't know. I guess they're still treating you as a freelancer, and I suppose that's better for you if you have if you had time to find other opportunities. But from what you've made clear here, it sounds like you don't really have time for other uh, esports ventures while you're working on this and doing your nine to five job at the same time. Yeah, uh, it was uh, a lot. Uh, I was yeah. <laughs> I casting for the new actually at the same point, so I was recording, filming, and, you know, doing voiceovers, uh, casting for the new and doing the CWL National League. So basically five nights a week, I was doing something esports related. And yeah, two nights a week, I was having to, you know, either stress about getting more voiceovers done or finding what little time I could spend with my uh, family. Oh boy. Aww. Pete's gone to Newell. He's, he's done the Newell live. Yeah. Well, He's upset though because they didn't let him wear his first suit while he was doing it. <laughs> <laughs> he told them he likes online tournaments. <sighs> he can wear that in the comfort of his own home. But, uh, yeah. Thank you, Avery. Yes. I'm so glad well, that you're allowed for this one. All right, we are running uh, dangerously low on time, so I just want to pop back to John for our, our final uh, thoughts. Uh, well. And then we introduced you at the beginning of this as the player development coach for Excel. Uh, so I guess just if you've got a chance here to reach out to anybody who maybe is thinking of trying to get into the coaching scene, who might you know might already be a shoutcaster or kind of just in the scene generally, uh, is there anything you'd, you'd like to kind of get out of them that would that you've learned that would make it easier for someone to transition into that kind of area? Um, I guess on the same point that we were just talking about, there's not the infrastructure within esports to let people be full time coaches other than a few, um, especially in the UK, other than a very few options. Like unless you're coaching for a top um, UK Prem team, you probably won't have a chance to do that. So that's something that I, that I would say that that's been a, yes, there is lots of money in esports as a whole, but there's not lots of money in, like the more you narrow it down, the less and less uh, money for there sure. is. When and it so gets into people are, organizations, well, uh, organizations almost always, especially at this level are incredibly friendly because they're small and they're passionate. And most of them either are still doing it voluntarily or have been doing it voluntarily for years. 
Um, so I think with a lot of this stuff is if it's something you really want to do, you have to be prepared to do it for free. Um, um, so John. I was a volunteer coach, for example, wait, just, just quickly. I was, so I was yeah, no. volunteering as a coach for something like four years before I am now making, um, like a living from it and stuff like that. So <laughs> do have that as something that you're prepared to do if this is what you want to pursue. Yeah, sure. Uh, my question was about that. Actually, you said that um, it's not really financially sustainable unless you're a coach for one of the top UK Prem teams. Uh, before this year, were there actually any full-time coaches in the UK Prem in the UK Prem scene besides? Well, I mean, um, even including the top teams. I mean, I'd, there was people getting paid. Um, I don't know. Yeah, if but it wasn't to like their full time to it. Um, it was I, like I, a hosting belong at game tournaments kind of paid, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah, so I think, um, well, I took a break from coaching um, to focus on film in the last year. Um, hmm. Well, year and a half now. Um, so that would be the time that I don't know. Um, so now there is. Um, when I yeah. stopped before, there wasn't. <laughs> and I don't know that <laughs> in between, basically. Um, I, think, I think probably just a transitional period. Um, but I think again, each each season there is going to be more and more teams. Yeah, get, having the full time getting, coach. Yeah, getting coaches, getting gaming houses, all that sort of thing. Um, so I mean, now is a really exciting time to get involved in coaching. And again, I would just just start doing it. If if you can't find any, um, like, oh, there's no second division anymore, but any sort of high ish Elo teams that want your advice and your input, um, then just do it wherever you can. It's still beneficial in terms of learning how to coach how to give people information to coach bronze teams and it's still just as useful practice as a coach um, because the biggest thing with coaching is there's a lot of people who know a lot about the game in terms of how they can break it down obviously a lot of color casters it's quite an easy transition the thing with coaching is you have to be able to teach people the stuff you know so it's not good enough just being a sixth voice on a team who just happens to know lots about macro and that's not going to be as effective as someone who even knows less than the players, let's say. Um, yeah, I mean, but, but you have these stuff. other roles, like assistant coach to the head coach. And I think it's, yes, it's about being a good teacher, especially if you're working in the UK scene, because a lot of these teams don't have luxury of having the assistant coach. Like, they're barely sustaining enough to pay the, um, the head coach. Uh, but I think, yeah, okay, finding the balance between knowledge and teaching is a is a tricky one. But on the yeah. other hand, if you've got a ton of knowledge, you're still of use as long as you can convey that yeah. to yeah. one person um, that can. Definitely. All, all I'm saying is that just because you're coaching people who are bronze, don't think that you're not learning something um, as a mm. coach, um, even though, yeah, they're not going to be able to do all these crazy macro plays that you have in your mind. But identifying their biggest weaknesses and prioritizing what you want to work on and finding a way to work on it like how how we're going to play these next set of scrims or however you're doing practice so that we can work on your biggest issues as a team that's the stuff that's useful and that can be useful regardless of who you're coaching and again yeah. from an organizational point of view if you're let's say one of the maybe one of the lower teams in esl prem and you're looking for a coach or you're looking for a new coach i don't know um, how a lot of their staffing works um but the difference between someone who's just like i could convince you in an interview that i've got really good game knowledge or someone who's like i've got good game knowledge and i've been coaching any team that i can get my hands on just because i want the experience and i want to practice and i want to get as good as possible that's obviously going to be something that will set you apart so again it comes i mean not quite the same as the content thing but it does come back to just get started yeah um, this isn't start, just yeah. the league either this is yeah, the well actually Yes, it's for the other esports as well, but uh, I think League is actually doing a little bit better than them in terms of sustainability and in terms of the weekly league. But um, as the other guys said, there is that. Sorry, there are opportunities in the other scenes, but if you're looking for such a specific role as coach, I'm I'd say be wary of and be realistic about your expectations for what you can find within the UK scene, because the UK League scene, as we've heard a lot about is not all that big um and the scenes for most of these other games is even smaller for that in in the uk to be honest i mean hopefully with the things like we've got the british esports association bringing out the nsc the new kind of university league not to bring up any rivalries between that and the new but oh. stuff like <laughs> that the oxford uh, oxford cambridge varsity coming up soon as well there is 
it's not it's not for definite don't get me wrong but there are kind of increasingly mm. efforts to bring that to the uk obviously with things like tesla in the us there are much more opportunities within that so yeah, yeah no i'm just totally into this. Sort of, what, I, what i was saying is that if if you're willing to get involved now when there's not like loads yeah of no for sure money sure. everywhere, that would put you in really good stead for the when people actually when, when there is stuff on. yeah it's like do we do we get the people who are just coming now now there's money or do we get the people who've been doing it uh, as a passion for the last year or two years or whatever it is mm. Mm. Okay. yeah okay and i think uh i think that's just about it you know i was going to make a joke about how it's getting late but then i realized there's a time difference between us and it's only like 1 45 in the afternoon there and i was gonna be like oh man i think alex has bedtime before school tomorrow ah, no, it's a bad <laughs> Joke, jokes on you i'm on study leave so i don't even have school <laughs> study leave study leave man i remember Jesus. study leave i do nothing wait oh, didn't you say you were 19 don't you still have like no, I'm, I'm 17 yeah but i mean it's not exactly i'm 22 oh i thought uh... you said you were 19 I thought he I was, was 19. Say. All right, well, I think this is as good a time as any to throw this podcast into a dumpster and set it on fire. So thank you so much for everybody to turn out for. It's been an absolute pleasure. For John Ellis. Uh, I guess Ibris is kind of a host, I guess. You don't get that. <laughs> if you can call it that. Yeah, sure, yeah. why not? Uh, Alex, not that Chrome Carmichael. Chris, Chris Stealth Curtis. Thank you guys for showing up and uh, yeah, and I guess I'll just reiterate for any of you guys who listen to this on day of posting that if you do want to get up in London and get involved in that Clash event that John is helping sort out, then do so today because that's when it is closing. Yes. Right. Thank you, Mr. Peter Counterfeit Hartner. <laughs> Why are right. you laughing? There was nothing funny about that. It was sincere. All right, guys, we'll catch you all next time and thanks for listening.